Welcome to the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network's program today. This is uh, July 13th, 2021. And I am going to turn it over to Mick O'Neill to introduce our program today. Mick, if you'd like to unmute and take that away. Thank you, Beth. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mick O'Neill and I live in Farmington, New Mexico. I'm a retired professor with New Mexico State University. I have the great pleasure of introducing today Gary Neban, the University of Arizona Kellogg Chair in Southwest Borderlands Food and Water Security, a desert agroecologist, ethnobiologist, biocultural restoration practitioner who has worked with, in, and for desert communities for nearly 50 years. He is an interfaith Franciscan brother a literary naturalist who has authored or edited more than 33 books in seven languages. Dr. Neban was honored with the John Burroughs Medal for Nat Nature Writing, the MacArthur Genius Award, a Lenin Literary Award, a Pew Fellowship in Conservation and Ev Environment, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Conservation Biology and a Kivera Coalition Award for Excellence in Science. And Kivera Coalition is one of our regular partners in these webinars. I first met Gary in the late 1970s when we were both graduate students at the University of Arizona in the Plant and Sciences, Plant Sciences Department. Upon graduation, we followed different but similar career paths. I worked in agricultural and natural resources management research in Africa for 25 years, while Gary expanded his agroecology interests in the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts of Mexico and the United States, as well as interests, as well as other arid environments in Lebanon, Egypt, and Oman. When considering speakers for this series, I approached Gary with suggestions, four suggestions regarding potential presenters. Without hesitation, he suggested the late Hugh Fitzsimmons, who many of you will remember, gave an excellent presentation in February, 2021, through his son, Patrick, about their civil pastoral operations in bison and mesquite management in Texas. I'm sure this presentation will be as memorable as that of the Fitzsimmons father and son team. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Gary to give this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Beverly. Can you all hear me okay? Thumbs up. <laughs> good, good, good. And I want to dedicate this to my dear friend who died this past year, Hugh Fitzsimmons, and my mentor on uh, desert crop plants, uh, Richard Felger uh, in Silver City, who's, uh, who will be celebrating his life um, uh, with all his friends together later in this month. And just express my gratitude to both uh, Mick for inviting me in and putting together an incredible series all together. Uh, it's just been remarkable and also a special thanks to Beverly for not only um, uh, bring it, bringing this all together, but helping me with some logistical things that I've been having trouble with since I had some um, traumatic brain injuries. So hopefully the traumatic brain injuries will not be uh, the uh, most noticeable part of this talk and uh, we'll get going. Um, and I'm just going to be saying next now and then because Beverly will be changing the image uh, from uh, that side. Um, first of all, I want to say that I don't do anything alone and then I'm always sort of embarrassed when um, someone reads some awards I've gotten because uh, if I had my way um, every time something like that happened, uh, 20 colleagues would uh, 
receive the same thing. So I never work in a vacuum and uh, the um, eight or so people involved in, in uh, helping me with this presentation include the people on the Plans People Planet uh, paper that I'll be talking about that came out last year, uh, particularly uh, Aaron Reardon and a team where we're trying to apply this in coastal Sonora, uh, where I've just come back from, that include uh, my wife, Lori Monti, and uh, Siri Indian tribal members, Alberto Mayado and Erica Barnett. So uh, this is a team effort like everything I do, and I just want to acknowledge it. Even listening to six people is a, a drop in the bucket compared to all the collaborators that uh, have taught me uh, what I know and that I constantly benefit from their wisdom. Um, and I want to say that I'm going to focus on a model for agroforestry that isn't fully developed in the United States, but is farther along in Mexico. And uh, tonight we're having a, a talk in Tucson by Gerardo Luis Smith of the Bio Organica Farms who is really going to show Arizonans uh, some uh, remarkable advances that have been made in uh, the Altiplano of, uh, of Mexico, the semi-arid landscape just south of the Chihuahua Desert. With that introduction, let's um, uh, change slides. Thank you, Beverly. Next. Uh, no one who's uh, listened to the radio uh, or TV or uh, read newspapers in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, thinks that it's only the deserts of North America that are being affected by uh, severely hot and uh, dangerously dry conditions. Uh, w when uh, Many of us heard about the fires in British Columbia and the record temperatures in Oregon and Washington. We realize that this is not simply an issue for those of us who are desert dwellers. And um, this kind of um, shockwave through the American media, especially the digital media, is becoming more and more common. About 15 years ago, I wrote something in New York Times called A Coming Climate Crisis about how many of our conventional crops are already hitting their temperature thresholds for flowering and fruiting, which for many uh, C3 annual uh, crops, uh, crops I love like chilies and tomatoes and some beans, is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the canopy. Well, this last year, the average daytime temperatures for Arizona were 95 degrees, which means, you know, at least half the year we're getting temperatures way, way above that. So um, this relentless drought and the heat waves associated with it, at least some of the time, are really um, hitting the limits of uh, the physiological um, conditions required for annual crop production. And that's why all of you who are involved in agroforestry are so important to the future of our food security at this point in time. There may be reasons other than food security that drive you, but that has to be added to something that that all of us have to take into account because these kind of conditions simply aren't going to go away. Uh, next uh, slide, Beverly. And I, I want to remind you that it's not just Canada and the United States that are affecting these conditions, but 80% of the Mexican Republic has been suffering some level of drought through the summer of uh, 2021 in Sonora, where I just came back from. It's something like 46% of the entire state is affecting is affected by severe drought. But if we take uh, the geographer's lead and look at what the arid lands of North America really are, um, extending down even across the tropics of cancer into central Mexico. 
we're dealing with an enormous portion of all of North America that for millennia have faced um, hot, dry, water scarce conditions. And this will be the proving grounds of just concepts and how we proceed in the future. The arid lands of North America, uh, what I call arid America, a term that geographers have used for about uh, 70 years, um, is in a sense a laboratory of the future for all food production in North America. It may not be that they can grow cacti or agaves, but they're going to have to conceptually take into account uh, many of the concepts that we've been tossing around in this uh, lecture series. And so I, I hope we can all own that, that we may have been interested, as Mick has been, in these topics for, for over 50 years, but now we're key essential workers to the future of food security and agriculture in North America because the issues that we're dealing with in this lecture series are of our, our paramount importance, certainly to all the Western states and provinces in Mexico, Canada, and the US, but really to the food security of the rest of the country and world. Next uh, image, please. And I want to remind you that, <clears throat> like with a number of other uh, social, environmental, and health factors, uh, farm workers are the ones most hardest hit by um, the stresses exerted upon our um, uh, food producing systems. That uh, in Arizona already, aside from the COVID year, uh, uh, the professions with the highest number of emergency room and urgent care visits are now outdoor workers, including farm workers, landscapers, and foresters. Um, and it's not just heat exhaustion and dehydration that they're facing, but very serious long-term effects like heat stroke and muscle wasting. So we're coming into a time where climate change is the greatest health challenge that threatens every aspect of society. Um, uh, a lot of the maladies that are of longer term consequences that are aggravated by heat and uh, dehydration are lumped together as diseases of oxidative stress. And actually livestock scientists and producers were ahead of um, human physiologists in suggesting that we all need antioxidants, like uh, cattle regularly get them in their uh, salt blocks now. But most of the people around us in the Southwest and Western states in general are chronically walking around dehydrated and in a state of oxidative stress. And so we really have to take this uh, seriously in terms of its economic costs. The, the failure of, of uh, uh, crops due to heat and drought is certainly an economic and social factor, but so is the health um, cost to our farm workers and outdoor workers like forest. Uh, next image. So, <clears throat> in ways, because we know that uh, literally hundreds of our domesticated annual crops are now reaching their thermal thresholds in the kind of conditions that we're regularly facing. One strategy is to turn to wild plants that um, have um, highly desirable uh, food plants but have never been produced in any abundance because of their superb adaptations to heat and drought. Hoping that we can both produce more stable yields of um, healthful foods, but also that we can get ones that are rich in the antioxidants that we need to deal with this, these diseases of oxidative stress. And ranchers remind me that yield stability is their major issue, that they've always had uh, 
bumper crops for grass and cattle one every five years or one every 10 years. But to do what Arizona ranchers are doing right now of selling off the herds uh, because there's just no grass to be had and, and supplemental forage of such high cost, and then rebuild their herds takes three to four years minimum. So any time that we can stabilize the yields of our pastures, our forests, and our agricultural food production systems, um, we're really keeping our food producers out of extended debt. And fortunately, there's a variety of really delicious, nutritious food crops that we can turn to as possible alternatives. And from the very start, we have to realize that they have some traits that are not agronomically um, acceptable. Uh, many of the pods break open and drop their seeds. There's that simultaneous uh, ripening of them. Um, uh, they, uh, some of them have anti-nutritional factors in their seeds, fruits, or leaves. So it's not like these, this is a clear ticket to success, but, it, but with all the uh, crop genomics that has happened, many of these um, candidates, wild species are in those same genera, and we have the chance of more rapidly bringing them to into uh, commercial production and to the table than at any time in human history since plant domestication began, I should say. Uh, next image. Now, it's not just that botanists can guide us through which of those uh, plants um, have been uh, have edible parts with uh, um, uh, highly nutritious uh, uh, seed, uh, leaf, root, or, um, or stock uh, uh, production. But we also have one of the best um, ethnobotanical records in the Southwest, both archeologically and in terms of the um, living cultures of the desert Southwest that remind us uh, that well within these, this last century, um, our indigenous neighbors have continued the use of many of these plants that now we're considering uh, for possible use in agroforestry systems. Uh, the five um, uh, Native nations that I uh, note at the top are the ones that I've spent most time with. But uh, people who have really have thousands of years of, of knowledge about how to use these plants. And together, there's about 150 uh, wild native plant species in 86 genera that they've regularly used. And, and about 100 of those plant species have been used um, by multiple cultures in the Sonoran, Chihuahuan, and Mojave and Great Basin deserts, uh, not just um, in the Sonoran Desert region where I've done most of my work. So 100 genera with, with uh, 200 to 300 species of crop candidates is a lot of choices for us to adapt to. And some may work better in the Chihuahuan Desert. Some may work better in Southern California than Central Arizona. But all I'm saying is that if any region has good botany and good ethnobotany and, and uh, uh, forestry research that can help us jumpstart the use of some of these plants, it's the uh, uh, desert borderlands for this region that we, that we call Arid America. Next image. So we're doing a funny little dance here that uh, palynologists have done for a long time. Most of the palynologists that I went to grad school with were looking at historic record of climate. And they refined their statistical techniques and their sampling techniques and, and many other um, elements to be able to go back and retrodict past climates and what plants were dominant during those past climates. 
you can take that retrodiction and flip it as a paleontologist have done. And several of them have now received Nobel prizes for predicting climate change and its effect on vegetation, plant productivity, et cetera. And we can do the same with uh, historical botany and ethnobotany to use the kind of tools that we once developed for retrodicting prehistoric diets to now predicting uh, what kind of diets will be most optimal in the future given the prevailing climatic conditions 50 to 100 years from now. So as my friend Patricia Colunga Garcia Marin, uh, uh, a great uh, ethnobotanist and, and uh, and geneticist who said, our future is ancestral. We have to not throw away everything from the past, but selectively take from it to build a healthier, more sustainable future. Next image. So that's what we did in this paper that came out, um, I guess, uh, about a year ago uh, in this new journal, Plants, People, and Planet, that's sort of a hybrid between a, a science news journal and a, and a technical um, science journal. And you can see that about a dozen of us collaborated on this from both sides of the border and people that had a wide range of uh, backgrounds from plant physiology to uh, historical ethnobotany to desert ecology, et cetera. And um, our goal was to provide uh, a framework that could be adapted to other climate conditions and uh, uh, social settings for selecting arid adapted food crops to reduce food system vulnerabilities. And we're not just talking about the direct, brutal physical effects of climate change itself, but these uh, biotic effects that you, if you will, climate related illness and, and um, the economic disparities that are predominant in the borderlands where uh, people on the Mexican side of the border in agriculture get paid less than a tenth of what our workers do in the Southwest, and that's not anything to brag about at this point in time. So we have enormous disparities economically and in terms of um, opportunities, whether you live north or south of the U.S.-Mexico border. But ironically, that makes a lot of our Mexican collaborators let's say, uh, leaner and meaner in wanting to adopt agroforestry systems because they just don't have the economic uh, investments, in, uh, the, the capital, to uh, try to uh, bandage together uh, a, a um, uh, wounded conventional agriculture anymore. They really have to think about an altogether different system with lower inputs at this point in time. And that's one of the reasons I think they're ahead of us on um, actually implementing some of this. Next image, please. Now, one of the things that um, uh, a couple of my friends chuckled that I squandered my MacArthur uh, uh, grant money on is doing a crosswalk between ecophysiological adaptations of desert plants and um, what those plants do when we ingest them and uh, our human physiology and metabolism um, become influenced by them. And one of the key concepts that we came up with is it's some of the very same substances that keep desert plants um, protected from solar radiation, damaging PAR, from um, uh, uh, high heat levels, and from uh, water scarcity at the root level or at the tissue level. Those very same substances, like uh, the mucilages that we see in prickly pear, the lactomannan gums and mesquite, or the inulins and agaves, 
actually provide protection in the human metabolism against both water loss, many of them are antioxidants, so they help us deal with the radiation stress and the, and the heat stress, but they also slow down the digestion and absorption of sugars um, uh, so that uh, people who are vulnerable to diabetes uh, don't have insulin dysfunction to the extent that they would if they didn't eat these foods. So basically, there's a number of desert plants superbly adapted to hot and dry conditions that also have uh, biochemical substances in them to deal with those issues that are very good for human nutrition and in fact um, can help us deal with the most costly human problems affecting uh, northern Mexico and uh, southwest U.S. human populations and that's uh, premature obesity and children and adult onset diabetes. Of course there's other adaptations that these plants have like deep and extensive root systems and sloughing off roots um, during drought and quickly uh, regrowing them uh, during the um, when rains come like they have the last week or two in Arizona. So we have really rapid responses of these plants um, to uh, uh, the windfall periods where we have good moisture and uh, nutrient fluxes coming into a system. But all I'm saying here is that um, it's really good to crosswalk plant physiology with human physiology when we're selecting these crops. Let's move to the next image. And I'm going to start going through these uh, pretty quickly. So what we're saying here is that we can take the concept of biomimicry, taking uh, what works in nature and some of the designs architecturally or biochemically, and use them to engineer. I need to learn how to spell engineering um, to, to inspire nature-based solutions in our agricultural system and in our diet. And in particular, we're using for a lot of our studies not biomimicry of a single plant architecture, but the uh, architectural unit that we call a, a desert nurse plant guild that was first explored on Kumamak Hill at the Carnegie Desert Lab, where I have my office today uh, through the University of Arizona. And it's, these are cohesive, repeatable guilds or or um, plant associations of a uh, overstory nurse plant, usually a legume, and a lot of understory cacti agaves and berry producing shrubs, some shrubs. And um, they can, their designs can be models for solar collection and energy capture, water harvesting and retention, soil carbon sequestration, and buffering up. Uh, plants from extreme conditions. Let's look at the next slide and we'll see how a model for using these guilds can help us. First of all, we can take uh, the wild uh, nurse plant guild that we see right at Tumamak Hill under a Palo Verde or a uh, um, mesquite, mesquite tree to the right of the screen with uh, saguaros and, and uh, wolf berries and barrel cacti and uh, annuals like uh, wild temperies and desert chia underneath them and use that as many permaculture activists have done to design uh, what are called keyhole gardens sometime where water flows into a, a u-shaped or donut shaped area and you grow understory food plants under a, a nursery much as Madre cacao, uh, uh, a tropical tree is used in agroforestry systems with coffee or uh, cacao trees underneath it. So these nurse plant guilds aren't restricted to desert areas in any way, but they're a key feature for regeneration in all of the North American deserts. And so we can now use that model for designing both agroforestry systems 
in these agrovoltaic systems I'll show you in a moment. Next image. So with um, my dear colleague and brilliant friend, uh, Greg Baron Gafford, um, who did his dissertation on mesquite and its role in, uh, in nurse plant gills and in water pumping and nutrient pumping to guild members. We started to do some experiments using um, solar collectors as a surrogate for nurse plants in providing uh, a buffer from damaging solar radiation, high heat, actually in the winter, uh, low temperatures as well. And we can catch rainfall um, off of the collectors and then funnel those down directly to the roots of plants through drip systems, water cisterns as well. And this is the very earliest stage of our um, agroforestry work up at Biosphere 2, but now we have six different sites, one in Mexico and uh, five in the Tucson area where we're doing this. So the solar panels are surrogate uh, shade structures like nurse trees. Obviously, they don't fix nitrogen. And there's um, other ways that they aren't truly analogous to um, desert trees, but they do serve as really effective buffers against high heat, solar radiation, and catastrophic freezes. And if they're if the solar collectors are placed high enough so that agricultural workers can um, periodically cut annual or perennial herbs like oreganos and, and basils and uh, stevia and, and many other uh, herbs, thyme and rosemary, um, the workers can do those repeated cuttings during the summer months under temperatures 20 degrees less than what they would suffer if they were out in the open all the time. So there's really advantages to the workers, not just to the crops of having these um, agrivoltaic systems. Next image. So we're, we're part of a team that with the University of, Air, uh, of Sonora, um, and two regional institutes, one in Ensenada, Baja, California, and one in Sonora, that are working with um, the indigenous communities along the coast of the Gulf of California to look at their historic use of wild plants and see which of those we can use in agroforestry systems to provide greater food security for their remote villages. And we're doing the uh, model of this that will start uh, building next week with Brad Lancaster and Ben Wilder and a cast of characters right at the base of Tumamak Hill where the desert lab uh, occurs about two miles away from the main University of Arizona campus. Uh, next image. So we're calling these particular agroforestry systems, agrovoltaic perennial polycultures, because all of them will not have tall trees, will alley crop tall trees between the uh, rows of solar panels, for some reasons I'll get into in a minute. But under the panels, of course, we're not going to have full-fledged uh, 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 eight uh, 20 meter tall trees. We're, using them around the collectors and smaller woody perennials and succulent perennials underneath. The idea is to work on what people in the climate change world now call the water energy food nexus at our agricultural systems, uh, not just our farms, but the whole food system is one of the largest contributors uh, to carbon emissions, but we can flip that around where it's pulling down more carbon than other kinds of ag agriculture, even some kinds of natural environments. So by collating the generation of renewable energy, fresh water, and food plants on the same site, we begin to capture some of those synergies that will help us reduce and slow down climate change and potentially reverse it. 
Secondly, the climate the uh, climate scientists that do microclimate studies like Greg Beer and Gafford does around solar collectors have demonstrated that most of the solar collectors in the Southwest and Northern Mexico no longer work with optimum efficiency because um, the panels get above 95 degrees and then their efficiency per unit time in generating renewable energy begins to drop. If you plant green belts around them, you bring them back into the optimal temperatures for uh, producing re uh, renewable en energy over a longer period of the year. So ironically, it's not just that the understory plants need the solar collectors, but the solar collectors need greenery in and around them to produce at optimal efficiencies. We've also done studies to show that there's higher bricks content with the plants, that's uh, soluble solids and an indicator of one of many of food quality and, and um, palatability. And that uh, by uh, grow, growing in 40% shade each day, their bricks content is higher, uh, the growth rates are higher, and their stress levels are lower. And then I already have talked about farm worker comfort and health in a shaded, cooler work environment, and that the harvested water off solar panels can be one of the irrigation sources. Next image. So we're designing agroforestry systems in a way that I don't think has ever been explicitly done before, but it's probably intuitively done by the best agroforestry people we know. And that's that it's not just about getting higher yields of woody biomass or edible biomass. It's simultaneously trying to take care of healthy food production or, or production environments uh, so that the agricultural, agroecological functions in those environments are optimal. It's taking care of human health and it's taking care of human well-being all at the same time. The criticism that we had of uh, agricultural development systems like the Green Revolution is, is really largely talking about yield and hoping that higher yield will be higher income and that'll all trickle down to help human health and, and community well-being. And we just think we need to be a little bit more intentional about that. When I talked to Norman Borlaug, the fine scientist that got the Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution System, he himself admitted that his big mistake was not working with small agricultural communities and, and smaller uh, hilly watersheds. His, his uh, systems only worked out on large uh, uh, level valleys with a lot of high technological input. So I don't need to read all these potential values uh, to you. You can pick them up from the paper at your own leisure. But what I'm saying is our checkoff box for whether a crop is worth integrating into an agroforestry system is that it meets most, if not all, of these um, indicators. Next image. So I'm just going to go through um, some of these uh, features, and that's a picture of our dear friend Barbara Rose, uh, who's on this call, um, harvesting Prisopis volutina uh, in the Tucson area, and then a picture of a remarkable range of uh, mesquite food products that the Sierra Indian people that I just did this permaculture workshop with in Sonora uh, have done for years, about 15 different foods in addition to probiotic beverages for mesquite. So these are palatable, they're in the marketplace again. And I should say in the next several slides, within the last 10 years, we've generated, helped jumpstart 40 new micro enterprises in the Tucson area that produced 140 new food products in our marketplace our cafes, restaurants, and farmers markets and gift shops that come from the 
wild species that we're talking about, talking about in these agroforestry systems. So there's incredible demand for these foods at this point in time among chefs and among um, uh, common citizens. Next image. Um, I've just been involved in uh, harvesting uh, cactus fruit from three different columnar cacti, but also planting under solar collectors and mesquite trees. Uh, um, other cacti like uh, dragon fruit that has an incredibly uh, lucrative growing market in the United States, Mexico, and Europe. The saguaros themselves have had commercial products off and on over the years, and there's now some ways to propagate them and other columnar cacti through cuttings that speed up their time to maturity uh, uh, to be about 10 to 100 fold faster than the normal maturation kind of first fruit for columnar cacti. Next image. This is uh, uh, one system of um, agroforestry with agaves, uh, two species of columnar cacti, mesquite, uh, another legume called wamuchil that some of you may know, and uh, several tree acacias that is being used in southern uh, Jalisco and Michoacan. Some of the people grow the um, uh, alley crop, these columnar cacti, with corn beans and squash between rows of them, and then windbreaks of mesquite and wamul chill around them. But they're having incredibly high economic yields off these mixed species, mixed life form systems. And uh, however it, messy it looks to the human eye, what that is doing is producing multiple yields over a season's time so that you can keep a labor force going and producing income year round rather than just having a quick pulse harvest and then a lot of uh, maintenance costs the rest of the year. Next image. Again, that has six or seven species in it. Of course, many of you know that prickly pear have been um, economic crops in California and Arizona for decades. We have the largest wild harvest of prickly pears anywhere in the United States in the foothills of the Santa Rita Mountains uh, that produces hundreds of tons of prickly pear syrup and other uh, prickly pear uh, products each year. But there's all kinds of new uses, and this is one of the best uh, uh, foods, especially the nopales, producing blood sugar and blood cholesterol levels among diabetics. Next image. Uh, wild chilies are in the perennial polyculture that it, I have at my home. These little uh, chilies um, have never been replaced by domesticated chilies in local marketplaces in the Sonoran Desert. They now go for $75 to $100 a pound and um, have to be grown under nurse plants or they'll be um, uh, riddled with diseases and insect problems. So some of these things are really nurse plant understory obligates uh, and very, very high in antioxidants. Next image. Uh, choya buds, uh, the cylindro puncha, offshoot of the uh, prickly pear genus puncha or platia puncha now, um, is also having a revival. Um, I recently had them in uh, some incredible fermented foods uh, in St. Louis at Missouri Botanical Garden people took me to, but they're being sold in Tucson at least a dozen places and easy to harvest and pretty, pretty easy to maintain an agroforestry system because some of them grow in a tree-like fashion that you can prune to keep them at breast height so you have ease of harvesting them and 
some years I've harvested 20 to 30 pounds of them myself. Next image. Um, the legumes are not as water use efficient as the uh, succulents like prickly pear and choya and agaves that are two to six times more water use efficient than uh, C3 and C4 crops. But they have other advantages. Uh, Capri beans can root six to eight feet uh, in soils in less than two months. Uh, they're they're ephemerized annuals that only need to be irrigated three or four times uh, over two months to produce usable yields. I once measured a 1,200 pound per acre yield in a, in a field in Sonora that had only received two really drenching rains. Um, but they're, they're also very good for uh, um, managing diabetes and they have a very strong market now thanks to Terry and Ramona Buttons on the Gila River community that have won awards for their capri production for over 30 years and take their profits to make these beans and other diabetes preventing foods available to the elders and, and youth programs on their Gila River Indian community reservation. Next slide. I should say capris can flower in temperatures over 105 degrees and uh, in the same fields, uh, pino beans abort all their flowers and don't produce any fruit. So what we're coming back to is, is not uh, uh, a completely futuristic Judson kind of agroforestry system, nor a metro uh, uh, ancestral kind of agroforestry system, but one that integrates traditional knowledge with emerging technologies. If you've ever tried to hand harvest uh, 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 seeds from this coxcomb amaranth, you know it's pretty tedious. If you um, have tried to grow agaves from seed, you know there's a long time frame, but um, what we're doing uh, at this picture with my feet is using uh, mycorrhizal inocula uh, on agave uh, uh, offshoots that uh, not only increases their growth rates, but also um, increases their uh, size, the robustness of the plants, uh, their uh, disease and their heat tolerance. So now, with so many um, mycorrhizae being isolated um, so that we can inoculate things other than uh, common crop plants with, we can really use the um, uh, traditional desert food plants with new technologies like uh, uh, beneficial microbes to rapidly jumpstart um, uh, crop production and uh, bring some of these plants to maturity much quicker. Next uh, image, please. So looking ahead, I uh, this is a view from my office on Tumac Hill over Tucson. And we know we've lost most of the arable agricultural lands that Tucson once had over its 4,100 year history of agriculture. Uh, some of the first fields in Tucson were an oldest known by archeologists. I'm right below Tumamakil in a mountain. But we have the opportunity to take the knowledge from the incredible paleoecological and archeological studies, the great uh, forestry studies that have been done at the School of Natural Resources um, and the uh, Plant Material Center uh, in Tucson of NRCS and pull those strands together. And I think what we need in desert lands today when they're talking about a, 
uh, a, uh, a green work uh, or for the United States to get us out of our economic depression. We really need to start that in the desert areas and do the kind of collaborative ramp up that scientists did during the Dust Bowl. We had more than 500 people at the Plant Materials Center in Tucson. Now we have four staffers. Or what we had in Southern Arizona and Southern California during the Waiuli Emergency Rubber Project in the 30s and 40s, where we had over 2,000 uh, top class scientists, four of which won Nobel Prizes. Uh, dedicated to bringing the Waiuli rubber plant from the Chihuahuan Desert into crop production. With the genomics that we have to do this, with the advanced uh, water conserving technologies and monitoring systems we have, applying some of these to designing successful agroforestry agro systems can really be to our advantage. But it can't be done piecemeal. It can't be done by a single school of agriculture or a single research institute. We need an initiative of, like I said, 1,000 to 2,000 scientists over several states and several different agencies and institutions saying that we desperately need to come up with these new agroforestry systems within the next 20 years if our food security is does not descend into chaos within the next 80 years. So we are the proving grounds, the laboratory of the future, and I hope you all take that to heart and encourage your students and colleagues to join together collaboratively rather than comp competitively to really get this remarkable opportunity moving in a way that helps people from going hungry and helps our farm workers from facing terrible, terrible conditions that they're already facing in most of the border states. Thank you so much. And I'm willing to uh, uh, work with Beverly to field your questions. Gary, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation. It's been wonderful, very inspirational. And I think you can count on SWAN as a conduit for your excitement to increase the agroforestry throughout the Southwest and beyond. Thank you, Gary, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Bev now. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. This, this has been phenomenal. So um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can all you know, see each other a little better. And if you have some questions or if you have some specific comments, um, I'd like to welcome you to at this time, go ahead and share those. If you do wanna raise your hand, if, um, I can call on you or if you want to jump in, you are welcome to do so. So do we have any um, comments or questions at this time? I will say that the only comment I have at this point is how hungry I am now. That was amazing looking food. Absolutely amazing. I'll just say something about that, Beverly. A lot of these things have been studied by our agroforestry scientists and uh, botanists for over a hundred years. Why are they back in restaurants today? the incredible interest and support that our innovative chefs have for seeing something special to our region on people's plates when they come to Arizona or New Mexico or West Texas. And so we used to whine that nobody wanted to eat these things, but we knew they grew well here. And now it's the opposite. We can't even keep up with the chef's demands and they're doing incredible thing and winning international awards for doing that. Yeah, yeah, that is that is phenomenal. And I I think that not only it's tastiness, but it's just the it, beauty of this food is really incredible. So um, Irene has uh, a question here. 
Is there a list of plants and how their fruits plant parts can be harvested, especially plants under solar panels? Well, thank you, Irene. I'll, I'll take that as a two-part question. Um, one of the things that's difficult about these new uh, journals like Plants, People, Planet is that much of the data for your paper is put in supplemental materials that people might uh, just not notice that there's incredible detail packed in the supplemental materials. I don't typically go through it because in some kinds of papers, it could put you to sleep in two seconds. But if you're after something, it's really great. And so we do have the list of plants and their fruits and parts and how they are scored on this matrix that we've come up with. Greg Baron Gafford and I are, are still working on the um, plant list of which um, perennials do best under solar collectors. And obviously uh, we can prune taller trees so that they can fit under high strut solar panels, but we're really looking at more at sub, sub shrubs, some vining uh, woody perennials and other things. And in some cases, we're looking at using uh, perennial wild species as rootstock and um, grafting common domesticates on that because most of the drought and heat adaptations are in the rootstock stop, stop, root stock more than the graft. So things like um, Merlot grapes on Arizona wild grape rootstock or um, uh, Carpathian and English walnuts on um, Arizona uh, walnut rootstock. So we don't have that second list fully developed. We want it to be more rigorously determined than what we've done so far. But what, in general, what we're looking for is um, uh, perennial subshrubs like the Mexican oregano's Lipia uh, berlandieri or Lipia graviolens that can get um, four to six feet high, but you can prune them back to one fifth that size in the winter, reduce their woody biomass um, metabolic cost, and then when the spring comes, it all comes back in, in uh, harvestable foliage. And some of those things you can cut four to five times a summer. And so the multiple cutting plants like stevias and oreganos seem to be ideal for this. And nearly every plant we put under them does better under 40% shade during the day than under 100% uh, shade. Okay, thank you. Um, Carol wanted to know, are the scientists at U of A and other Southwestern universities working with nonprofits to create training for the masses to speed progress in developing what you have presented here today? Um, the answer is yes, in a, a promising, but albeit preliminary way. We just had a seed grant that brought together um, Arizona Cooperative Extension, Par Parker Filer for one, um, the um, kitchen garden nutrition staff of the U of A, uh, Cal's uh, School of Agriculture and Nutrition, um, uh, Mission Garden, um, uh, the Desert Lab at Tulumakil, the Desert Museum, et cetera, in developing materials that can be used by any extension agent. So those can all be gotten from Parker uh, at the U of A uh, Extension main office on Campbell Avenue, Campbell Avenue Farm in Tucson, and they're both in Spanish and English. And uh, although our project phase one is coming to a halt in, um, in uh, September, we're now filing for a longer continuation with more partners. We, we, we really want to wrap this up so this information can be made available on reservations in uh, Spanish-speaking communities and English-speaking communities. And the extension people have been great. They're those folks and the NRCS people we have today are just on fire about this kind of stuff. 
Um, it's it's just wonderful to see how many um, dynamic, innovative professionals we have in both those organizations. Um, Jim wants to know how well documented is the link between certain Sonoran Desert plant chemical properties and how they may help people handle the heat. It's a fascinating connection. Yeah, so um, there's pretty good inventories done for reasons other than health issues, interestingly enough, on the antioxidant content of about 50 Sonoran Desert plants. Uh, they also, you know, all of us may not uh, be interested in uh, having little tincture bottles of aromatics along with us to calm us down when we're in a traffic jam. But there's a broader literature on what um, antioxidants are in the essential oils of desert plants. And of course, you know, when we say the desert smells like rain, we're talking about the aromatic oils of all the wonderful Sonoran desert plants that just put us, many of us in, in the Tucson and Phoenix area into a trance. Those are antioxidants that when ingested that smelled as fragrances really benefit um, uh, stress reduction, just like resveratrol from grape skins do that uh, as another example. So there's tangible um, biochemical and pharmacological information on these things. And uh, some of that, there's about 50 papers on this stuff referred to in the Plants People Planet supplemental materials. I also had a paper in a, a journal that you may not have heard about. And don't be surprised because I didn't hear about it until I wrote for it called uh, uh, Ecopsychology that, that asked me for a paper on desert plants and their, their use in stress reduction uh, to heat and, and, um, and uh, dehydration. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and back to just that comment about the extension agencies and um, are there current efforts with those extension agencies and home health professionals to teach cooking and provide demonstration workshops with these new, in parentheses, old foods for the public? That's right. So, so um, you know, of course, extension includes some people that are doing that kind of nutrition teaching, not just the propagation and, and design of home gardens and home landscaping and, of course, all the work with farmers. But um, the this kitchen gardens program at U of A is really an extension related effort where um, undergrads, grad students, and their professors are doing this in low-income uh, districts in the Tucson area and beyond. And some of this is getting out to the reservations too. And so it's, it's a pretty um, small core of people overall because, of course, extension agents of their basic obligations to do, but they're bridging into these kind of issues more and more. And so I don't have any uh, uh, doubt that some of the other extension agencies are interested in helping out on this thing, but simply don't have the time. Yeah, and uh, Walker Simpson with uh, Arco Sante said he would love to be a part of that. So opportunity to contact the extension and see how you can get involved. Hmm. And um, yeah, I, go ahead. Some of this is up on the Tumamak Hill Desert Lab website. So all the uh, handouts are downloadable either this week or as of next week. Thank you. All right. Um, looks like we have responded to all the comments and the questions. If there's something that I've missed, quickly put that in the chat. Anybody, last call. And um, I would invite everyone um, to check out all the supplemental materials, get involved, help spread the word. Gary, we really appreciate this, this program and, and the work you've been doing across the Southwest for, for all the humans that live here. So thank you for that. 
and again, you you can already see that I'm drawing on some of the concepts that your other speakers have offered us. So none of us can do this work alone. We're all in it together. And please, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me or some of the other people that you see on these publications because uh, the bigger the heap of people enjoying doing this work, the better. Uh, it just won't get off the ground if if someone has some kind of artificial ownership uh, about it. We just all need to be rowing in the same direction. And that's what I love about your organization. So bless all of you for the wonderful work you do. Each day, you're the unsung heroes of our area. Thanks again. Thanks, Jerry. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for recognizing all the collaboration and support that you have in all of this, because like you say, we really are in this together. Blessings to all of you. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, Gary. And I would invite anyone who wants to to stay on. We're going to have a swan meeting and uh, just talk about um, some of the activities we've got planned into the future. Also note that I'm going to be sending out a link once this recording is posted and we will include those supplemental materials and links to resources in that. So be on the lookout for that this week. All right, and uh, I will turn it over to um, Steve. Did you want to take it from here and run the program? You bet. Thanks, Bev. Um, thanks again for uh, for Dr. Nabham coming to talk to us today. That was a really cool uh, presentation. It's got my wheels turning a little bit in my head. <laughs> Heard some other things. Um, so for those that don't know me, I'm the current chair of the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network. Um, my, my day job, I am actually with Extension, uh, Utah State University Extension in Eastern Utah. Um, so part of the business meeting, we just have our, our general agenda. We don't have a whole lot to talk about uh, on, on this, this quarterly webinar. Um, one thing I would like to bring to everyone's attention is in, so we're getting geared up to get our next face-to-face -face meeting for SWAN in 2022. Um, we were in 20, uh, in 2020, we were all geared up to actually have our face-to-face -face meeting down there in Tucson. Um, of course, mid-March, late March 2020 uh, is when, when the world kind of blew up on us a little bit. So we've kind of postponed that. Um, so we do have our, our site arranged and um, really soon we will be sending out sending out an email with registration links and some preliminary information for that May 2022 meeting, face-to-face -face meeting. It will be in Moab, Utah. So um, we hope that those that are interested can, can join us. It should be a, a good time. Uh, we're, I'm really excited to, to get to kind of showcase some of the things going on in Utah and, and invite speakers. Um, so it is, we, we are faced with a little bit of a challenge in that inherently all of us that want to come to these also want to look at live plants, uh, live plants in, in the south, <laughs> the southeastern corner of Utah also overlap with uh, um, when we have live tourists. So that is a little bit of a uh, interesting thing, but Moab's a, a really interesting place. If you haven't been there, it, it is kind of the uh, world-renowned outdoor recreation gem of, of Utah. So we're, we're excited to bring that to you guys. Um, look forward to more information. If you are not currently, if, you're, if you have interest in this, but you are not currently on the SWAN mailing list. Um, we're pretty easy to find. It's SWAN site uh, hyphenated. 
site.org. Uh, so you should be able to find us and sign up for our mailing list to get, uh, get some forthcoming information. Um, also, our next meeting, next quarterly meeting will be October 12th. Um, Donna Davis from Colorado has kind of spearheaded that. She's done a lot of work in getting some, some great speakers lined up for us, just like we had today with Dr. Nabhan. So we'll have the, um, the a permaculture group from Omaha talking uh, uh, about their, their demo site and what they're doing there. Um, we'll also have another producer um, that's been doing some agroforestry work down in, um, uh, down in Mexico. Uh, she's, she's back and forth between the United States and Mexico. So they're getting up and going and we'll get to take a look at some of the things they're, they're doing down there. Um, so if you're if you're on the mailing list, look for that as well. Um, I don't know if I have much more as far as business uh, for Swan, uh, unless anybody else has something that they would like to let us on to. Um, you can also include information in the chat box as well. All right. Hey, um, Steve, since we have confirmed and finalized Moab, do we have a, a contract with a property? Um, do we have specific dates or do we just know it's going to be Moab? Yes. So we, we do have a contract with the, um, the Spring Hill Group. So there's two different hotels there. Um, we sent a a um, survey out to our SWAN mailing list looking for interest. And there is some, there, there are some folks that are a little bit concerned uh, um, about the cost. Um, we're looking at um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $200 a night to, to be there, um, which, for those traveling with the family, maybe that works very well. For those that are um, maybe just on your own or, or doing this off uh, on, on your own, your own uh, dime, there are plenty of options there in Moab, um, very close to town as far as campsites, um, RV areas, um, KOAs, there are um, also smaller hotels. Um, and if anybody, when we release that information and send it out to folks, if, if you have some questions about Moab or maybe some, some tips on where to find some alternative lodging, uh, please, please let me know. We have plenty of folks around that can help point us in, in some alternatives if that's a, a concern of yours. Um, we, we also will be hopefully using the brand new Utah State University uh, building there in Moab for the majority of the conference. Uh, construction is on schedule at this point, but uh, it's, it's always hard to know with university construction projects. So we, we may or may not be utilizing the uh, meeting space for more of the business meetings but we still, we will be having our, our standard business meetings um, as well as our, um, our suite of invited presenters for the symposium. So it, it should be good. Um, and I, after this call, uh, I can send you that link, Bev, so we, okay. can, we can get that out to folks. Yep, yep, let's go ahead and start thinking about how we set it up and get some save the date information and get people excited about it. So is yeah. it, Steve, is it gonna be in, in May? Is that what we're looking at or what do, you, do we, I can't yes. remember what the dates are. Yep, it will be in May. Um, I would, well, I'm not gonna make you guys wait on me to 
to figure out the week, but it's it's going to be in mid mid May. Okay, great. So, Steve, do we have to guarantee a minimum number of rooms occupied for, as part of this contract? So we we have a minimum number of rooms that are reserved. Um, now we can change those numbers 30 days pre-conference. So hopefully as we get registrations in, we can adjust, um, which is one reason I'd really like to get that information out to folks. So if you're, if you're interested and, and you for sure want to be there, as soon as you get that registration information, please sign up early because it will really help us adjust our numbers um, to ensure that we're, we're putting on the best conference we, we have. We don't want to leave anybody out, of, out in the uh, heat <laughs> in the desert uh, if, if uh, that's not what you want to be doing. So uh, yes, please register early. All right. and, and Steve, I have a lot of um, more logistical questions because the one, the program that we had scheduled earlier in Tucson, we were working a lot on the logistical parts to help facilitate registration and credit card processing and all those things. And we still have registrations on hold through that system. So I wanna make sure that um, when I hear the registration is going on, is somebody else doing that? Or is that something that we would be doing to work through um, to make that happen? So as far as the, um, the room registrations are, are handled by the hotel, they have their right. own system there. Right. Um, as far as conference registrations, we will need to set up something for us to, some sort of management system to use, um, which I need to talk to you about Bev to see what it is that you use for the Tucson meeting. Um, I anticipate that that was probably it's that was probably logistically a, a lot larger task than than what I'm envisioning Moab will be just because of the size of the area. Um, yeah, but, the logistics uh, of yeah, the logistics. It's a lot of work. You guys did a lot of work. <laughs> well, we, it's it's what we do. So it's not like this is a a challenge piece. What what only becomes challenging is if we don't have like a runway to make sure that we're all on the same page and we had a couple of specifically logistics meetings about okay these are the things we're going to do and then I would set up these registration systems and at the time there was a, a small grant helping fund some of these processes mm -hmm. so um, I think we need to like call a conference logistics meeting and then let's talk about you know what these things are and Corey was really involved last time as a Tucson representative, Corey from um, the um, Arizona Before Forest Street. Environment oh, yeah. Management. Yeah. So she would be a good resource to come in as well and say, here's what we were doing, here's what we were planning, these were some of the processes, and then work with our Moab counterparts to make sure that we're producing something that is logistically smooth, super easy for people to participate in and builds that enthusiasm. So, um, so maybe setting in place a conference planning team. I mean, it could all be all these same people, but then also invite um, our Moab contacts, Corey, a couple other people who were involved last time and make sure we're covering all those logistics spaces. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think where you guys have, have done this, um, being able to draw on that, that experience uh, would be super helpful to me. Um, I, yeah. yeah, well, let, well, let me just, uh, and I think, Steve, you may know this, but Bev, correct me if I'm wrong, you are actually holding money still. Yeah, that's comfort. what I mentioned. Yeah. We still have registrations, which is I mean, why we need to be very involved because we people asked us to hold that money and trust until the next meeting came up. Right. And so exactly. we would be the ones to manage that registration piece and help make sure that happens. So I'm just testing to see if there was somebody else out there that I need to work with. And if not, then I think we should funnel this back through 
ACTC since we're already holding those registrations. Well, and yeah, and I guess I'm just going to say it. I mean, if BEV and ACTC can continue on and perhaps do the registration for the Moab meeting, that might, if BEV is willing, that might make all the sense in the world. Yeah, that would be, and, and we don't want to, you know, those, those people that already paid and, and trusted us to kind of migrate over to that new meeting. We, we definitely don't want to miss those folks. So, um, yep. yeah, you and I, Bev, need to, need to look and see, see what we need to do to, to get that rolling as well. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so who all is going to be on this conference planning committee? Is it the people that are on this Zoom call right here or some people missing from this call? It might be a good idea to send something out to the general membership list and ask if there are people who would be interested. That that could also, um, yeah, I, I think in particular, um, yeah, as we get get our team together looking for, and, and if there is anybody on the call right now that, that's interested, uh, please enter your information or, or pipe up and, and we can get you down for sure. But yeah, getting, getting enough support to be able to make this happen is, is a number one priority right now um, because it's, it's a lot of logistics yep. um, and we want, we want everything to go good. Oh yeah. And building a local team, Steve, for, you know, an in Utah team, you know, I, it seems like that could be most helpful in these kind of <laughs> events. We um, absolutely need a Moab team member, at least. But if there's yeah. one, that would be great. That's that's critical to success. We, we have a few folks that are, uh, do you have an interest in, in joining us to help with that aspect as well? Yeah. Well, it seems I'm, like, I'm you know, just... State, I don't know, and maybe I can help. And Kate, who's on here, whether there are folks in state forestry, conservation district, NRCS, you probably know those folks, Steve, but maybe you yeah. don't. Um, I, this I, is a I good way. Yeah, it's a good and way to we, build Swan too. Absolutely, um, and and we we do have um, our our. They, they've had some switch over for the state forester in that region. Um, well, they've had multiple switchovers very recently, but uh, yeah, our state forester, uh, Natalie Comlin, she is super interested in agroforestry and mm, she's good. She's willing to, to be a little bit of a, a champion for us to, to get this going. So I, I have no doubt that we have support on on that side of things. Good. They, they actually even, uh, <laughs> they've, they've thought about doing away with our agroforestry uh, uh, award for, for forester professionals in the state. Um, but uh, now, now that we're up and rolling with Swan, they're, they're holding on to it. And we, we get a lot of invites to things, so. Good. Excellent, excellent. I would like to hold a conference planning um, preliminary committee meeting, um, maybe even early next month. I've got a big old book of business to finish out with this. But, um, I'll send out a doodle poll to the people who are on this call and Corey Dolan and Steve, if you can give me the names of the Moab people. And let's at least just do a huddle and say, what's our timelines? What's our tactical checklists that we need to be going over? And if there's an opportunity to begin sourcing funding so that we can afford to pay for speakers, if um, we need to cover travel costs, anything we can do to um, help cover all the other costs. And the further advanced we get, the more potential for sponsorships and people to bring money in to help support this. Now, the last time we did this program, ACTC was the um, fiscal management 
company mm -hmm. would be happy to you know continue to help with that and hold hold money and trust to move it out that direction and we'll go back through and look at what we've we've still got so that we've got that money to move forward um that we had from the past as well yeah we'll, we'll for sure need need that aspect of actc for sure um migrating funds um it's a very slick way to to deal with the, the financial aspect of this so i i appreciate your your support in that yeah. and because we are a 501c3 i think it it you know we have all the transparency built in and the um responsible systems so absolutely I think it's a good match. Okay. Yeah, you are. I mean, not not just for that Tucson event, but Bev, my understanding is you are Swan's fiscal sponsor. You are our 501 C3, mm -hmm. you know, the website and otherwise. So yeah. Uh, and that's mucho appreciated. Yep. And that is that is what we've been doing. You know, every time, you know, we kind of shift it up and I hear different things i want to make sure that we're all still on the same page so so i'm going to send out a doodle poll we're going to get together in early august we're going to do a preliminary um, huddle over this and we'll start getting some some things organized excellent thanks all for right. setting that up Bab. all right can you i can i uh shifting gears can i go back to donna and just i understand that our next program, our next Zoom program is going to be perma a permaculture group from Omaha. Is that for the October, um, is that for our October 12th SWAN program? Yes, that's what we're aiming for. Okay, and so Donna, have I, I can't remember, have I sent you the template for the, the agenda and the registration? piece on that to no, get. Okay. I actually have that. I can use the leftover from the last go round. Okay. Okay. But if, if you, you want to send it to me, that's fine. And just to kind of update, I, I haven't contacted the folks yet. We kind of left it with, uh, let's, we tried to do it in April with uh, one person and then with oh, yeah. the Mexico person, we just had her introduce her program and then we invited her to October. So I have to reconfirm that okay. we're all good and that the 12th will be uh, good. But I, I haven't turned that corner yet, I apologize. No, 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 we're, we're, we got plenty of time. It's just since we're together here, it's always good to, and then bet, you know, once we get the agenda done, Bev gives me the registration link and then Mick and I do the continuing ed thing with SAF and um, um, the uh, Agronomy Society. So it's always it's always good to get it done early. And I just paid my annual dues today, so I'll be able to do it. <laughs> so you can keep doing it. <laughs> okay. Well, and if anybody, I mean, we have a kind of a routine on these quarterly programs. And if somebody has a better way to do them, let's talk about it. But it seems to be working. And I don't know. I think these quarterly programs are, well, that was just excellent today yeah. oh my goodness and i think all of them have been really been well received agreed well down the line i try to get in touch with uh arnold clifford again mm -hmm. yeah because that's something i guess it's a little ways out there but if we stay on the normal schedule we would have another quarterly program january 11th um, if we want to do that and then our Face-to-face, -face, of course, looks like it's going to be May. So um, just bringing that up. Yeah. It was nice to see Kate um, plugging our webinar recordings yesterday in a, in a NAC meeting that we were both at. Well, good. <laughs> I think one or two of the folks who um, joined today were we're at that meeting and heard about it. That's great. Jim, do you want to give an update on any of the next steps? And for, uh, I don't know if that's, if there's anything to share, but um, 
you know, since the board is transitioned, it's uh, still a little like I'm not getting to hear what the national stuff is. Not sure if that's well, at, at the moment, um, NAC is holding, in fact, they're holding it right now, uh, a agroforestry silvix listening session. And what they're doing is planning something maybe along the lines of the Forest Service, uh, the old silvix manual, but, but specifically for agroforestry species. And so they're they're, they're in the midst of this two-day meeting. There was a meeting yesterday and a meeting today, uh, kind of talking about the issues, having pr presentations from different regions and um, kind of getting organized for that. And, and so I'm gonna jump into that here in a little bit and participate in the, the rest of that meeting today. Um, and they, they were a big presence at the North American Agroforestry Conference too, you know, that happened just recently. And the other thing is, I think you probably know, right? Because uh, most of you know anyway, that the NAC funded that proposal that Kavir Coalition led, but that Swan partnered with. And so uh, I think Leah will call a meeting before too long to get us organized and moving forward on that. So um, yeah, there's there's been uh, some interaction between Swan and NAC uh, recently that I think has been really productive. Uh, I, I'd like to just mention that uh, thanking uh, Leah and her team over at Kivara Coalition, we did get that first grant that she submitted. Mm -hmm. And then she sent out a doodle poll for another uh, grant proposal, along with oh, Edward's Mother Earth grant application. So if you haven't had a chance yet, please fill out the doodle poll if you're going to be able to join that meeting. Yeah, to me, that's a, a really promising partnership. It's already yielded some interesting results in terms of those listening sessions and um, that first grant. But I, I see all kinds of opportunities to continue to partner with Kavira Coalition. They're, they're pretty good. Good group to work with. They are, yeah. Yeah, she was going to join us today, but unfortunately, she has a staff meeting or something like that at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have any any other business for our business <clears throat> meeting portion? All right. Yeah, look forward to working with you, Steve, on the, as needed on the conference. Appreciate you taking the lead on that, and, and you, of course, have too. Yeah, yeah, it'll be, I, I'm excited. It should be a good, uh, I, I hope we get a, a, a decent handful of folks there that are willing to, willing to come to Moab, so. Attractive place to go. Yeah, I think you'll get a good turnout. Moab is just stunning. Who doesn't want to go to Moab? <laughs> well, I I try to stay away as much as possible, but I'm I also live an hour away, so. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I've I've said this before, but I think the time is now for agroforestry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Perhaps more Great. than ever. Like there's a lot of momentum building for it. it really does. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Well, um, I'm looking forward to our, our next uh, meeting on the conference. So look for that doodle poll so that we yep. can start making those plans. Good. Thanks, Thanks Ben. I appreciate all your work. All right. Thanks. You bet. All right. Well, you Thanks. all have a Thanks, great Beb. rest of your day. You bet. You too. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.